Um, so, so I think uh, I'll let you kind of in, in your own uh, language and go as short or as long as, as you want. But maybe just for those of us uh, that are not in the province or maybe detached a little bit from uh, from um, some some of the climatic trends uh, that Canada is facing, maybe give give us a local perspective uh, on on uh, on what's happening in Alberta. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um... I won't go too far back into uh, climatological history, uh, and I won't necessarily get much into climate change. However, these things are all relevant. Um, so here we are in Alberta with the uh, Canadian Rockies to our uh, west, and the Rockies are the natural continental divide. And so here we are in the prairies uh, downstream of those uh, mountains, which means the mountains are very important in, in terms of being the water towers or the source water uh, for all of the rivers uh, that drain in, a, in an easterly direction across the prairies and across the boreal forest. So that makes the mountains uh, incredibly important uh, from the water resources point of view, and in particular snowpack. So a lot of the uh, water that drains into the rivers throughout the year uh, originates as snowpack, uh, which is c collected during the winter. Um, so during the cold part of the year, <laughs> precipitation falls as solid snow. It doesn't run off. It just stays there. And then, of course, in the spring, um, you know, melt happens and, uh, and then the rivers uh, get filled. And as the temperatures warm going up the mountainside, then the, the snow melt uh, occurs over a few months. Anyway, <clears throat> that's a little bit of geography, but uh, it's important because what it means is the snowpack and um, where it lies and how much of it is a critical part of the water resource in Alberta, and in particular for uh, irrigation of agriculture and for the various uh, cities that lie along the uh, routes of the uh, rivers. So in particular, Lethbridge, where we are uh, located on the Old Man River, and of course, Calgary on the on the Bow River. And um, and of course, those, those rivers uh, originate in the mountains and so are very, very dependent on snowpack to support the communities uh, in those areas. Um, now, as a result of this, this uh, dependence on, on water, uh, there is uh, a, an existing monitoring infrastructure in place. Uh, so there are, there are gauges on the rivers, there are gauges in the mountains that monitor the, the depth, the rise and the fall of the snowpack or the, or the, de or the, um, the weight of the snowpack, which can be converted into a, a water equivalence. Um, and uh, there is a, a field monitoring program whereby every month, throughout the uh, fall and spring season when there is snow on the ground, uh, field crews go out and actually monitor the snowpack as well. So there's a fairly uh, sophisticated monitoring network and all of this is necessary to provide data to support uh, forecasting. So every uh, the end of every winter or around about this time of the year, so you know April, May, um, is when the snow is starting to melt and that's when we're starting to uh, have concerns or, or need to know what the water resources are likely going to be for the coming months to support things like irrigation for crops, right? So we're entering into the growing season right now and for um, other industrial and municipal uses. So it's a really critical uh, time of the year for water resources. And so all of the data that has been collected is going to go into uh, a number of models and a lot of people are employed in trying to make these predictions. Um, but one of the challenges, well, there's actually two challenges. Uh, one of them is that all of these field data, as, as numerous and costly as they may be, um, really only represent individual points. So there might be hundreds of data points collected during the winter by field crews, um, and there may be uh, continuous data records of, uh, of snowpack condition, but only at a handful of points. You know, like I forget the exact number, but on the order of 10 to 20 monitoring locations where there's automated um, continuous records and then a, a similar number, may, maybe it's up to 30 um, field. Yes, I think it is about 30 field sampling locations um, where they're visited multiple times throughout the year. So all of these data represent. Well, it is quite a lot of data, but it's still a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall area where the snow exists. So that's one challenge. It's it's actually a limited amount of data. The other challenge is that uh, even though in some cases the data might have been collected for over 100 years with climate change, and I'm going to bring climate change up, what um, 
um, the relationship between field data collected 100 years ago and the subsequent water resource has changed through time, right? So the, the, the interaction between snowpack in the mountains and water resources downstream has not remained constant, partly because the, the climate now is different to what it was 100 years ago, um, and also the land covers, like the, the forests, the vegetation, uh, urban developments, wildfires, uh, any of the impacts on the landscape uh, also alter the, the water balance and the hydrology. So all of that means you, you can't really utilize models that were developed historically to tell you you know, what a given snowpack measurement is likely to mean in terms of water resource. It just means the uncertainties are increasing. And so uh, when you've got very little snow, you really want to get a handle on. Um, so, so when you don't have a lot of snow, it's even more critical that you get more accurate estimates. And so that brings me to today. Um, we're now in a what's many people consider a multi-year drought. We've had a, a couple of preceding years that haven't been particularly high in terms of winter snowpack or summertime precipitation. Uh, last year, of course, was the warmest year on record, I think globally and regionally, very dry, lots of wildfires. <clears throat> and then we went into the winter, and uh, for many months throughout the winter, there really wasn't a lot of snowpack. In fact, um, up until January, there was, there was very little at all. And then luckily, earlier uh, in the year, January through to uh, April, uh, we did actually get quite a bit of snow, but it's still well below average. And I think uh, the government of Alberta say it's around about 20% below average. So I'll take their word for it. Um, but what we really needed was a year with a lot of snowpack uh, to make up for the deficit of the last couple of years. Um, and that hasn't happened. So we're in a situation right now where the soil water in the prairies is at a, a, I don't know if it's a record low, but it's but it's low. There's really not a lot of moisture in the in the ground, um, and so when when you add that onto not a lot of snowpack in the mountains, um, it suggests we're heading into a, a drought situation. And so you know you get one bad year, it's maybe not so bad. You you'll make up for it the next year, but when you get multiple years in a row like this, it just compounds and it gets gets worse. Uh, and so we are in a situation where uh, the, the government has uh, mandated some um, um, water use restrictions for uh, irrigation. So that could have impacts for agriculture and, uh, and food production. Um, and so obviously that also has economic impacts. So it, it, it's quite serious business, right? I mean, agriculture in Alberta and across the prairies is multi-billion dollar industry. Um, so, you know, and a lot of people's livelihoods depend on this. So so water and snowpack is actually kind of a big deal. A lot of people don't really think of it, you know, kind of take it for granted. Um, but, you know, it has multiple multi-billion dollar implications if if there isn't enough of it. Um, so uh, given this realization of the importance, given uh, not, um, not the best uh, data sampling routine, uh, you know, points uh, in space and um, uh, limited ability to predict what that exactly means in a year of very little snowpack uh, means there is a desire to explore other methods. And so uh, that's where uh, our lab comes in, where we um, have uh, been experimenting now for over 20 years with utilizing airborne LIDAR for snowpack mapping. First experiments, of course, were the Vivian Forest, utilizing uh, Optech calibration data near the uh, <laughs> then Quebec Corps calibration building uh, near Newmarket, Aurora. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, based on those surveys, we learned fairly early on that LIDAR could be used for snowpack mapping. But of course, it's maybe not the most cost effective or, uh, or efficient or accurate uh, method in in uh, certain circumstances and certainly not um, over 20 years ago but now with with advances in technology and reductions in uh, logistical costs uh, it is it is viable and in other parts of the world it uh, it has been used in a in a more operational context so that's what we're trying to do here, here in alberta right now is uh, utilize lidar for snowpack uh, water resource uh, mapping and modeling now of course the eastern slopes is a massive area i mean we're talking over 70,000 square kilometers. Um, if if you look at the area that drains into the major uh, river basins. So 
obviously we're not going to be flying that a couple of times every year. In fact, we're not even going to be flying it once a year. It's just too big of an area for, for airborne LIDAR. Um, so what we've um, elected to do and we've been experimenting with over the last uh, three or four years is just doing individual uh, transects, flight samples, um, uh, strategically located in a, in a grid going uh, from the essentially from the US border up to uh, Jasper uh, over an area of uh, three or four or maybe 500 uh, kilometers. Um, and so we can sample that area over four or five survey flights. And uh, then we can take those uh, transect samples, relate them to previously collected uh, samples during the summertime when there's no snow, subtract them, get the snow depth, and then combine them with uh, density information to get uh, snow water equivalent along those transects. <clears throat> now, it's not as simple as it sounds. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, additional quality control data cleaning that needs to go into that, and I'm sure you're well aware of all of those steps. Um, but anyway, once we have our, our models of uh, snow water equivalent along the transects, uh, then we can uh, use them to train um, spatially continuous models using a random forest imputation. And uh, we will look at other ways of imputing the data to give us a continuous uh, model. But for now, we, we've worked with uh, random forest and Google Earth Engine and with uh, ArcGIS Pro. And we seem to be getting pretty good results. We've done some um, uh, initial validations anyway, and the results are quite encouraging. Um, so the result of that is a is a spatially continuous map <coughs> of snow water equivalent for the for the whole of the headwaters of the Old Man River Basin and the Bow Basin uh, for now. And so uh, recently we've done that for uh, the early March and early April. And so we're able to track for those two uh, months how the snowpack uh, increased from March to April. <laughs> And um, what we hope is that that gives us very close to the peak snowpack accumulation for the year. The, in fact, it's it's probably pretty close to the peak, although there will be more snow accumulation in the uh, higher elevations in the headwaters, um, but it is already melting out at the lower elevations. So it seems to have been a, a pretty good time to capture the snowpack. And so as of, uh, well, this week, uh, we delivered the data to um, Alberta environment, the forecasting people there, and they're going to see what they can do with it. Uh, of course, this is experimental for them because they're not used to dealing with spatially continuous uh, snowpack data like this. So they have to themselves work out what they're going to do with it. Um, but one thing we're, we're doing in parallel is I've just sent the data to a professor at the University of Waterloo, James Craig. And he's inputting the data into his hydrological model, uh, the Raven hydrological model, mm. um, so that they can develop new ways to ingest these data structures in that modeling framework. Because again, the hydrological models are not normally set up to ingest spatially continuous snow water equivalent data. So this is kind of a, a new development and, and he is the model developer, so he can do those kind of things. Um, and then another one of my colleagues, Ryan um, McDonald, is a consultant in, in BC, uh, also alumni from the University of Lethbridge and um, colleague of mine. And so he uses the, the Raven model uh, and is currently employed or contracted by the government of Alberta to run some simulations to do some forecasting work for them. So he's kind of doing operational contract work for the government of Alberta. Uh, James Craig is doing the model development. We're doing the data collection. So we're all kind of working together uh, to try and do some of our own forecasting in parallel uh, with what the government of Alberta does using their, their own internal uh, standard procedures. And so we, we see this kind of an ecosystem of data and models and, and trying to put it all together to develop a new framework or a slightly new paradigm for water resource monitoring uh, here in Alberta. So all being well, things will work out and uh, maybe next year we'll refine the uh, the methodology to be, be a little bit quicker, uh, a little bit more operational and uh, eventually maybe maybe this will be a standard thing. So for now it's very much R&D um, and in fact before the first week in January we didn't know we were going to do this. We, we were we were planning to just do our regular, oh, we'll do a few transects. It's just pure research. Uh, but, you know, working with grad students, we'd have the next year to to work it up as part of a thesis, maybe. Uh, but then when the government of Alberta approached us 
uh, literally the second second of January. Um, for them, it was operational. It was like, okay, well, we need the results by the end of April. <laughs> Was a little bit odd for a university uh, professor and a few students mm -hmm. to commit to, right? It's like, well, they, we've got to do all of this within a couple of months. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we did, and and we got our results, and uh, and here we are. Um, and then the other question I had was, uh, help me a little bit um, uh, geographically restrain the area we care about. So so. Um, the, the where you where you lay your transects is is entirely in in the uh, eastern slopes of the Rockies, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. But the the uh, impacted uh, downhill region. Do you have a sense of of how, does it go all the way eastern of of, uh, of yeah, the province? Yeah. We need we need to look at a map of Canada, but um, yeah, it goes all the way. Uh, into the Nelson drainage, which goes into drains into Hudson Bay. So the uh, uh, the Old Man River Basin starts off um, immediately uh, west of Lethbridge, uh -huh. and uh, the southern extremity of the Old Man Basin is just in Glacier National Park in the U.S. So it is just a few kilometers south of the Canadian border, and then it goes up to um, Kananaskis, which is a little bit south of uh, Calgary in terms of the latitude. Uh, then the Bow Basin is immediately north of the Old Man. So that starts in the Kananaskis and then goes up to, well, I'm going to say Saskatchewan Crossing, which is about halfway between Banff and Jasper. So those are the two major drainages we're interested in, the Bow and the Old Man. So Old Man to the south, Bow slightly to the north. Old Man drains into to Lethbridge. The Bow drains into Calgary. And then those two rivers join up further to the east just before they cross over into Saskatchewan. And then it becomes the, the Saskatchewan River or the, the South Saskatchewan River, uh, which drains in, uh, well, it, it goes north towards uh, Saskatoon and then joins the North Saskatchewan River uh, somewhere around about middle of Saskatchewan becomes the singular Saskatchewan River and then continues to drain east across the prairies, uh, joins a couple of other rivers, I forget the names, but it becomes the Nelson eventually and then <clears throat> the Nelson drains into the into Hudson Bay. So essentially uh, the Bow and the Old Man are the headwaters for a, a, quite a large river system that drains all the way across the prairies uh, into Hudson Bay. So it's, uh, yeah, so the snowpack here ultimately drains into, uh, the, I guess, the the Arctic or the North Atlantic. Uh, no, it's, it's good to know. But, but really, I mean, the, the the provincial government is interested in in the communities really immediately downhill from the eastern slopes. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's a fair assumption, yeah. Yeah. So there's a few a few communities, but Lethbridge and and. Um, uh, Calgary are the two big ones for the for the bow and the old man. Uh, but it, another important element from the water resources point of view is that uh, provincially, uh, Alberta has um, uh, an obligation to maintain 50% of the natural flow in the Saskatchewan River system uh, into Saskatchewan, into the province of Saskatchewan. So it's not like Al if Alberta is really running short on water, we can't hold it all back. And just say no, it's our water. We want to keep it. You can't can't do that. You have to maintain fifty percent of that natural flow um, to the next uh, downstream province. So that's part of that interprovincial agreement, and that also that that's also why trying to understand how much is there is very important, because if you know what's there, then you can predict how much you need to keep uh, in order to maintain your or honor your commitment to your downstream um, constituents. That that's really good. I'm glad I asked this question. Um, so that that's very helpful. It clarifies the question about the uh, region of interest. Um, the other question I have uh, when it comes to uh, really, um, I, I know you I know you you've you've done this as as uh, early as as uh, the early '90s, but I'm going to call it the innovation. <laughs> and, um, as part of, of the innovation and the proposal of, of doing this in, with an aerial approach in a much more spatially extensive method. Um, but but um, in 
like um have you uh, done uh, this campaign uh, in a, in the same extent in prior years? Uh, no, no, this is the first time. Uh, well, actually, last year we tried to, uh, but it, in fact, <laughs> no, actually, last year we tried to do Jasper uh, Park, Banff Park, and, uh, well, I, no, let me back up. We, we tried to do Old Man Bow and Athabasca last year. Uh, however, it took us a long time and we couldn't coordinate with the field crews. It was it was ambitious and it didn't work out. And so uh, after we started, we decided we weren't going to bother with the Jasper piece because it just wasn't viable, wasn't wasn't practical, given our timelines and our budgets. Um, so we, we, we focused in and we uh, yeah, we didn't quite cover as much ground as we did this year. Um, but that was our first attempt at trying to do it over a larger area. So we learned a lot last last year. Mm. Um, so yeah, but, but this this year I think we had a little bit more of a budget, which helped. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's good. I think that's good. So so uh, really, the, the conclusion on on this on the um, frequency and the extent is this year is is the biggest of its kind. But over the years, you've done a myriad of, of airborne snow sampling. Oh, yeah, we've done a lot. I mean, we, yeah. we've been doing snow sampling every year since 2014. Yeah. Uh, and, and prior to that, with 2008, we did a campaign for with the government of Alberta and uh, over the elbow. And yeah, and prior to that, you remember in, in Ontario. So we, we've done quite a lot over the years, but it's always been over a much more focused area. Last winter was the first time, like 2023 winter, uh, March was the first time we ever tried to do over a much larger area, but um, but we have done transect sampling before. But we did the first time we did that was 2008. Uh, however, at that time we didn't have the kind of cloud-based computing and um, and the more sophisticated machine learning imputation uh, methods available to us, or at least not as easily available to us. So the, the technology uh, in terms of hardware and software has kind of converged now that it, it is actually more feasible to do this kind of thing, whereas 10 years ago, it would have been quite challenging. It's mm, really good to hear. Um, and Chris, um, I uh, this is probably a little bit outside uh, what the article is interested in, but it's within what Malik is interested in. What... what um, um, what, what's the uh, Google Earth Engine uh, overlap here? Uh, is it because of land cover and land use? Is, um, what's the intersection? What do you use it for? Um, well, the reason we're using Google Earth Engine is largely because it's fast, mm -hmm. right? It, and, it, and it can process over very large areas, right? I mean, in theory, you could process data over the entire global surface in Google Earth Engine if if you wanted to, because you're <laughs> you're utilizing Google's cloud-based computing capability. Whereas if I try to pull in massive data sets, uh, you know, hundreds of satellite imageries and lots of data layers into my own personal PC. And uh, now even if I have the RAM, you know, it it might take days and days or weeks to to process through all of that. Um, even with a high-end uh, PC. So, so so that's the real advantage of, of working in a cloud computing environment is that you can you can uh, run your scripts over big areas and lots of data structures and just let it run and, it, and it'll do it fairly efficiently quite quickly. Um, so we, we did that in parallel with uh, sitting on my machine and working in ArcGIS Pro. So uh, Personally, I like working in ArcGIS Pro. I'm comfortable with that environment and I, I can set it up. I I have quite a bit of control. I know what's going on. Whereas in the Google Earth Engine environment, the, the scripting can be a little bit more sophisticated. Sometimes you don't exactly know <laughs> what the what certain scripts are doing or what the data is doing behind the scenes. So it's I find that you've got a little bit less control in that environment and, and you end up dealing with a lot more artifacts in the data. Um, however, you can process big data quickly. So, you know, it's it's a trade-off. You can work in either environment, but they each have their uh, pros and cons. 
So I, mm. I think um, moving into an operational context, once we've worked out some of the bugs in the cloud-based computing environment, that would be the go-to place to do this kind of stuff because it's just quick. <clears throat> Good. Yeah, super. So last last question, and I know we're a few minutes over, uh, so I apologize. Um, just give, give me a, a glimpse of, of the results of the analysis. Um, I know the government said that they estimate 20% lower than average, but from from the depth maps you've saw you've seen from having done this before, just give me one or two numbers that are, that are yeah. notable, or, well, you know, or, honestly, or, or or 50 numbers. <laughs> uh, I I honestly have no way of telling you whether we're 20% below because we this is the first time we've done this kind of spatially yeah, yeah, yeah. continuous mapping, right? So so we have no baseline. The only the only baseline we have are the the field data. And the and the uh, snow pillows uh, that yeah. give a continuous record. Now all of those data do confirm that on, on average, you know, we're we're quite a bit below uh, typical snowpack. Um, now the only numbers I can give you are if I relate the snow water equivalent that we've measured or modeled uh, relative to the runoff. Um, in um, you know over the summer season, then for many of the basins uh, in in the old man, what I can say is that um, the snowpack that's there at the end of the winter seems to represent no more than uh, fifty percent of the summertime runoff. Now, the, the, but here's the. Uh, the uh, oh, sorry. So, fifty percent of the long-term average summertime runoff. But the thing is, I don't. It, it's hard to say what that really means, right? Because again, how much of the long-term summertime runoff would normally be from snowmelt, right? Mm -hmm. We we don't know. We don't we don't have those numbers. Um, so, sure, I can give you an estimate of how much snowpack is. In there, and, and on average, it's it's less than twenty centimeters of water equivalent. Right. So if if you had a if you step in a puddle of water and it's that deep, <laughs> right? That that's on average how much water is is sitting over most of the headwaters of the Rockies right now. Now, if that was snowpack, it would be a lot deeper, right? Because snow is not very dense. But if you condense it down to a water depth. It's it's something like that, you know, 15 to 20 centimeters. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but spread over many tens of thousands square kilometers, that's actually a lot of water. Uh, but whether it's a lot less than normal, you know, whether it's the 20 percent less that uh, the government of Alberta is suggesting, how would we know? Right. We have no yeah. no benchmark. So uh, the, the real take home from this is that we are creating new absolute estimates of of water storage in the mountains that we never had before mm -hmm. right because now i can i can give you a fairly uh, reasonable estimate of just how much water is up there when in the past we just had to guess from individual point measures so this could be the first year where we have these kind of data and if we keep doing this gradually over 10, 20 years or whatever, then we'll, you know, we'll start to have a record that we can look back on and say, yeah, this is more or less. But um, it's it's potentially paradigm shifting in terms of the regular uh, monitoring framework. And so I would like to see it be adopted as a standard, mm -hmm. um, but, but we'll see. That's the decision for somebody else as to whether it's operational, cost effective and uh, you know, is there really value for money for the taxpayer to do this kind of thing? Yeah, that's that's very good. I'm I'm, I'm glad you have a opinion on that. That's that's helpful for me to hear. Um, Chris, can I last thing? I, I promise. Can I share the screen uh, and, and have you just walk me a little bit through the two maps that you sent me? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's do that, and I think that'll be good. Um, because you gave me that 20 centimeter uh, number for uh, SWE, um, I want to get a sense of the number, uh, just make sure I'm reading the depth maps correctly. Um, you see my screen? Yeah, so that's the gap fraction, that's the vegetation map there. 
Yeah, so so um, what's the legend on that? Um, oh, yeah, okay. So um, it starts out at white, which would be 100% gap fraction or no canopy cover. So I, I colored it that way. So the white would be at the highest end of the mountains, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so it's not snow. It just means there's no vegetation there at all. And then the browns are where you've got a little bit of vegetation, but not a whole heck of a lot. So you see that more on the eastern periphery. And then the yellows to darker greens, that's where you've actually got uh, a lower gap fraction or higher canopy cover. So it, it, so the color ramp there is meant to represent something that looks pseudo natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's great. OK. Um, OK, and then depth. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. That's, that's the snow depth. So the orange would be um, approaching zero. So as we get out onto the prairies, onto the plains, then uh, you've got no snow there at all. So that's orange. And then you, you work your way through the yellows to the greens, to the blues, to the dark blues. And that's where you've got the deepest snowpack. So in the top left hand corner, that's uh, near the Wapta rice fields in the um, northwestern corner of the, the Bow River Basin. And so that's where you've got the deepest uh, water equivalent. So that's a, uh, no, sorry, that's depth. That's not water equivalent, that's, that's yeah. snowpack depth. <clears throat> Super. Um, good. Would you yep. have a SWE equivalent of this image? Yep. Okay, so yeah, maybe, uh, maybe. In that PDF report that I sent you, the I've got the SWE in uh, kind of white to blue uh, scale. And it's probably, I think it's about like zero to 0.6 of a meter or something in those maps. Uh, here? Yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, so that's the whole thing for April. Yeah, so the red dots are the field sampling locations, the, the little skinny lines of the galaxy transects, the, the black outlines of the individual drainage basins that we're modeling. And the the whites to blues are the snow water equivalent. So the the greatest snow water equivalent again is in the northwestern corner in the top end of the bow basin. And it's up to up to fifty centimeters. Yeah, maybe a touch over that, but the color ramp is up to fifty centimeters. So yeah, that's about half a meter of standing water. Uh huh. But but uh, um, a few seconds, a few minutes ago. Uh, despite despite some areas having 50s or maybe a touch over that, the average you said is it's about 20. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is mapped at a 30 meter grid resolution. Right. Right. So a, a, an individual grid cell could have over 50 centimeters of water equivalents and the snowpack could be over, could potentially be two meters. Over over that whole area, right? So you got two meters of snowpack, but still only fifty centimeters of water equivalents, and that's over a thirty meter grid cell. So at any mm. individual location, it could be much much deeper than that. But that's averaged over thirty meters. Uh, but then when I talk about the less than twenty or up to about twenty, that's a, that's for the entire basin. So if you look at those little black uh, black polygons there, mm -hmm. each one of those black outlines is a sub basin. Uh, that is gauged, right. where we actually have river, river runoff gauged. And so that's why uh, we aggregate to the basins, because if I know that there's, you know, 10 or 20 centimeters of standing water over that entire uh, drainage basin, then I know volumetrically exactly how much water that is. Yeah, so that's what these plots are showing you. They're telling you the, mm. the average uh, snow water equivalent depth uh, for the entire basin, averaged over its entire surface area. Very cool. So, oh, Chris, you're you uh, <laughs> you hit every every geeky spot in me. So that's it's <laughs> really mm. cool to see. Um, um, it's fantastic, Chris. Um, Chris, uh, um, I recall you, uh, you showed uh, in the other uh, email, you showed both March and April. Why did you do this twice? Uh, a whole bunch of reasons. Um, that's a good question because it was expensive to do it. <laughs> uh, uh, one was because historically, 
we've tended to focus on March because of uh, kind of weather stability. You know, things haven't started to melt by that point. And so we know there's a good chance we're going to have enough snowpack in March to actually do something. Um, and it won't have melted by then. Uh, and so it's still cold. Um, the other element was the Galaxy rental. And, you know, because originally when we planned this, it was just going to be research. It was just going to be another research data collection. However, uh, in early January, when we spoke to AEP about this, they actually wanted us to fly later in the season because they wanted it to be closer to the peak. And so now it became a more operational data collection. Um, but I'd already spoken to you about renting the Galaxy. And so instead of moving the Galaxy to April, I just thought, well, let's just do the two, right? We'll do one Galaxy, we'll do one Titan. And the benefit of that is that if we screwed up with the first survey, we'd learn something for the second survey because now, now I actually had a budget for the two. So I thought it would give us a bit of redundancy and we'd be able to see if there was any change from March to April. So there are, there are all kinds of reasons as to why we would do two. If we only had to do one, I would have done the April one. It would just make more sense to do it in April. But but then you do run the risk, right? If you're waiting and waiting to the to April, what if you have an early spring and things start to melt and then you miss it, <laughs> right? So th there's a lot of uncertainties you got to deal with. So um, it just all around seemed like a good idea to do too, even though it was an insane amount of work, uh, mm -hmm. and it really was. It was it was chaos <laughs> on our side and expensive, but uh, but I think it was worth doing the the two, and I think we learned a lot by doing the two. Yeah, that's very good. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, well, thank you, Malik, uh, Malik, and uh, and Alex, and yeah, yeah. Dennis, and everyone there that's helped us lately. Because uh, now it has been a good, um, good experience, and uh, sure, we'll we'll do more. Hey, maybe we'll rent the Galaxy off you again next winter. Yeah, well, well, for sure, for sure, for yeah. sure.